Okay, now we're going to talk about accelerated muscle loss, and uh, this often happens with chronic diseases. So, for example, diabetes and renal disease. Those are the two I'm going to you know address today, right? But there certainly are others. So, with diabetes, with renal disease, those chronic conditions actually predispose people to sarcopenia. Diabetes, you have high blood sugar, and that is very damaging to muscle tissue. So we damage the muscle, we lose muscle, and therefore we have accelerated muscle loss. It is very well known that if you are diabetic, then you have accelerated muscle loss. Okay, now this ends up being a really bad situation. Why? Because muscle is very important in terms of handling your blood sugar. You can consider it a sink for glucose, all right? So when you have glucose in your bloodstream, it has to go somewhere, and the best case scenario would be for it to go to some very metabolically active tissue so that we can consume it and use it up, right? That would be the best case scenario, and muscle is that metabolically active tissue, and plus, you know, it, it, if if we're talking about normal circumstances, it's 40% of your total body weight. So that's a large um, mass to be absorbing this blood sugar. So it acts as a good sink for blood sugar. So if we take, um, uh, let's just imagine, let's just imagine that you drank uh, 100 grams of a glucose solution, 100 grams of glucose, right? And imagine your total muscle you know, volume is really the size of a dumpster. Yeah, I'm just using this so you get a visual. So a dumpster size um, container for that 100 grams of glucose. That's a great thing, right? And you don't have to worry because you've got lots of room for that glucose to go. No problem. But let's just say instead of the dumpster, you now have, you have a pail, okay, a tiny little pail. And now you have that 100 grams of glucose, and yeah, it doesn't have the same amount of space to go into. Instead of a dumpster, it's got this little pail. And inevitably, some of it will spill out. Spill out where? It will spill out into the circulation, into your bloodstream and also into organs where it is very inflammatory, okay? So now you have this extra blood sugar now that is circulating in your bloodstream because your muscle mass has shrunk, your sink is smaller, and this excess blood sugar is damaging to muscle, so we shrink the muscle component even more. Right? We keep shrinking that muscle component with this accelerated muscle loss, such that the blood sugar now is going to get higher and higher, even if you are eating the same thing. You're keeping the same dietary regimen. All right? I'm not changing anything, Dr. Law. I'm eating the same. Why is my blood sugar going up? Well, if you are losing muscle, which is your greatest glucose sink, you have less place to put the glucose, so it's going to spill out into the bloodstream, and your blood sugar readings are going to be higher. Right? You can see that's a lose-lose situation. No good. Now let's look at renal disease. Right? Sarcopenia, very common in uh, renal disease. And in fact, um, most, most patients that I see uh, that have kidney disease really do have sarcopenia. I, I don't think I've seen any renal patients without sarcopenia. So in the old days, they would say, if you have renal disease, we have to restrict protein. You can't eat that much protein. It's going to damage your kidneys, blah, de, blah, de, blah. But what we know now is actually, if you treat the sarcopenia, you are going to improve kidney function. I'll say that again. If you treat the sarcopenia, you will improve kidney function most of the time. I've certainly seen that in my patient population. Right? So there is actually a loosening now of the 
protein restrictions around um, renal patients. Now they're actually encouraging higher amounts of protein, the most recent recommendations. Because really, if you prioritize addressing the sarcopenia, you will um, help the renal disease get better. Sarcopenia also predicts mortality in uh, renal transplant patients. So if someone's going to get a renal transplant, kidney transplant, and they have sarcopenia, yeah, they're not going to do well. Mortality rate is high in those patients. We really should be assessing them for sarcopenia, and most of them have sarcopenia, um, and the worse it is, then the worse they do, the more likely they are to die with that kidney transplant, right? I remember um, we had a case, and this was a young woman. She was in her early 30s. She had congenital kidney disease, so very young. Um, she had her first kidney transplant. Those don't last forever. So now she found herself in her 30s needing the second kidney transplant. And um, she came to me because she wanted to really make sure that she was in the best condition possible before the transplant operation, which meant that we had to buffer up. We had to get her muscle mass up because with good muscle mass, she was going to tolerate that surgery better which was what we did. We spent a few months really working with her, getting her muscle mass optimized, right? And then she went to surgery. Now, normally, is what she told me, and I did see her after surgery, um, she said, well, the, the transplant doctor told me that I would be in the hospital for, for about four days after the kidney transplant, right? Actually, they sent her home on the second day. They sent her home on the second day because she did so well. She had no complications, tolerated the procedure really well. A, she was young. I'll give you that. B, though, we really worked on that muscle mass, right? So really, if there are kidney patients out there, you want to prioritize your muscle mass. And now, the last thing briefly that I want to talk about is this condition called cachexia, spelled C-A-C-H-E. XIA, cachexia. This is advanced and accelerated muscle loss in a hyper inflammatory environment. Okay, so we see this most commonly, I think, we think about cancer patients. Now, people don't realize this, but 20% of all cancer patients die from the cachexia, from this advanced and accelerated muscle loss alone. They are not dying from the cancer, they are not dying from the chemo, they're not dying from the treatment. They are dying from the muscle loss, this accelerated um, advanced muscle loss under hyperinflammatory conditions that the cancer sets up, right? So those patients you want to prioritize. I actually believe that anyone with cancer should get an assessment to make sure what their uh, baseline lean mass is, and you do that by DEXA. And then you need to follow them because you catch them in the pre cachectic stage when you start to see some muscle loss. That's the only time you might have a chance of treating it. So you want to know early if someone is going down the road towards cachexia, right? I don't want to go into detail with that. If that is something you want me to talk about, I can certainly do a full episode on that. Let me know in the comments, okay? All right, so we have cancer cachexia, but we also have cardiac cachexia. So patients with heart failure, for example, they're very debilitated. They can't get out of bed, so they can't move very much, right? And so they will have advanced loss of muscle as well, and that's an inflammatory milieu as well in their bodies. And they will have cardiac cachexia. Uh, respiratory cachexia, that we see in patients with COPD, the patients with emphysema. And again, they're very deconditioned and they can't do a lot of physical activity. Their nutrition is poor and they have hyperinflammatory situation in their body. So they get into these cachectic stage, uh, states where they lose so much muscle that they don't even have enough muscle to help them breathe. Right? So that breathing itself becomes very difficult. So that would be respiratory cachexia. Again, all types of cachexia, they're not easy to treat because they're associated with a lot of inflammation as well. And you know, your best chance of treating it is catching it early.